I remember an incident from our eldest daughter's early grade school years. You know, she was at that age when she was developing concepts of right and wrong. A group of her friends were visiting, and one of them had climbed into a cupboard and taken some candy. So I gathered all the children and asked who had taken the candy, and each child firmly denied taking it. When it came to my daughter, of course, she denied taking it, and then she became very serious and said, well, maybe I did take it, but I just don't remember. Well, my wife and I knew who had taken the candy, and it wasn't our daughter. Later, we took the opportunity to explain to our daughter that although we admired her desire to be honest, she should feel guilty only when she had actually done something wrong. What is guilt? How do we deal with overwhelming feelings of guilt? What happens when you disobey God and have to deal with actual guilt? Some people are destroyed by feelings of guilt. Others feel no guilt at all, no matter what they do. Well, today, we're going to show you from the Bible how God wants to take you from guilt to glory and answer the question, will God forgive you? Join our host, Gary Petty, and his guests as they help you understand your future on Beyond Today. What is guilt? Well, simply stated, guilt is having disobeyed a law or moral precept. If a person is caught stealing, he is brought before a judge and declared guilty in accordance with the law. The law then requires a, a penalty or compensation. Well, we're going to come back to talk about guilt in a few minutes. But first, I want to talk about the emotions of feeling guilty. Feeling guilty is a condition of anxiety and stress experienced because of the breaking of a, or sometimes is perceived breaking, of a law or moral precept. Guilty feelings can lead you to taking personal responsibility and accountability and positive change. Now, guilty feelings can also lead you to hopelessness and despair. Let's look at three kinds of feelings associated with guilt. Then we'll take a look at what is real guilt and how to deal with feeling guilty. The first kind of guilt I want to talk about is shamelessness. Shamelessness is when a person's conscience has been so scarred that he or she feels little or no remorse for actions or thoughts, no matter how destructive those actions and thoughts are. People like this have no responsibility to others or to the law. Now, shamelessness is the basis for so many television reality shows. It's the attraction of the scandalous stories of celebrities or politicians who are caught cheating on their spouses or stealing funds. We marvel at how many people just seem to have no sense of guilt. Now, on the other hand, most people do feel guilty about some things they've done. Now, what we feel guilty about is developed in us at a very early age. This leads us to the second kind of guilt. Feelings of guilt learned from society or family. Now, guilty feelings based in society or family norms can be very good, or they can be negative. Have you ever felt guilty because you didn't do as good as someone else, maybe a sister, on a test, or aren't as talented as a coworker, even though you're doing your best? You know, as a pastor, I've counseled many people who suffer from overwhelming feelings of guilt. Feelings of guilt because he pursued his dreams and went to college instead of staying home on the farm and helping the family, or because she didn't marry the person everybody else wanted her to marry, or because of a mistake made many years ago that the person just can't forget, even to the point that the person feels that God will not forgive him. We can feel guilty because we don't say no to a salesman. Have you ever felt that way? I mean, you don't want to hurt somebody's feelings, right? People can actually feel guilty because our friends are participating in something we believe is wrong. I mean, teenagers do this all the time. They can feel guilty because they don't want to lose friends if they don't smoke weed, and then they feel guilty if they do because they know it's wrong. 
This sense of guilt is based in an internal conflict of values. And you will never learn how to deal with guilt until you understand your core values. These core values must be based in the standards established by God. You know, guilty emotions are manipulated by advertisers just to get us to buy products. Some people can be made to feel guilty because an actor in a white smock implies that they are inadequate because they don't buy a particular brand of athletic shoes or toilet bowl cleanser or toothpaste. The kind of guilt caused by society, peer pressure, and parental teachings can be constructive in creating social norms. It can also be destructive in creating emotional turmoil that has really nothing to do with universal moral precepts. Now, this brings us to our third kind of guilt feelings. Guilt based on breaking a law or standard established by God. Now, when we are truly aware of, of the greatness and goodness of God, we also become acutely aware of our own weaknesses and lack of goodness. The gospel, the good news, is only meaningful when we become intensely conscious of the bad news. The bad news has to do with us and our guilt. Our Creator has moral laws and standards that reflect His nature. When you and I break those laws and standards, we are guilty before Him. It is a, a literal state of guilt established by the laws of God and declared by the lawgiver Himself. And you will never find the remedy for your spiritual longing or even understand the profound meaning of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ until you accept your actual guilt before the moral laws and standards of the Creator. Yes, the acceptance of this guilt produces guilty feelings, but these guilty feelings should lead us to certain actions. By, by motivating us to acknowledge our absolute state of guilt before God's laws, and by causing us to accept our worthlessness without God, and then by leading us to ask for Christ's sacrifice to be applied to our guilt. A wonderful example of guilt producing positive action is found in Psalm 32. In verse 1, King David writes, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Now understand, David at this point is experiencing a profound feeling and intellectual understanding that he has been forgiven. His sin's covered. In other words, it's gone. He can't see it anymore. And he's blessed, blessed by God. He goes on to say, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. You know, David had to realize that he had to stop deceiving himself. He had to face his guilt, that it was real, and that God declared him guilty. Now, before he experienced this blessing of forgiveness, he experienced something else. He says, when I kept silent, you know, before he confessed his sin to God, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. He said it felt like God's hand was just on him, like a hundred pounds, just driving him into the ground. But then he goes on and he says this. Listen to this, because this is what you need. David said, I acknowledge my sin to you, and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Like David, by accepting your actual guilt before God's standards and confessing your guilt to God, you can experience the same kind of, of profound forgiveness. And God's forgiveness means that you are no longer in a state of guilt and can participate in a unified, loving relationship with Him. You can then experience the freedom of a guiltless conscience. In this relationship, God teaches us the reality of good and evil 
to the standards of His law. We are motivated to stop doing the actions that, that made us guilty in the first place. This produces real change in our lives. Now, to help you experience this change in your life, let me briefly tell you about today's free study aid, Tools for Spiritual Growth. This valuable free publication will provide you with vital information on how you can actively grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To request your own copy of Tools for Spiritual Growth, please call toll free 1 888 886 8632. That's 1 888 886 8632. If you live outside of North America, please contact us by writing to the address on your screen. Or if you prefer, Visit our website at beyondtoday.tv to read or download it right now. So, please don't wait. Order your free copy of Tools for Spiritual Growth right now. We're looking forward to hearing from you. We've been discussing how the emotional state of feeling guilty can produce positive or negative effects in your life. Now, let's look at two examples that can help us understand the concept of feeling guilty. The first one is in Matthew 26. It's the night when Jesus was taken to be beaten and put on trial. Now, Jesus had already told Peter, one of his disciples, that he would deny him. Peter is waiting outside in the compound where Jesus is facing his accusers. Now, let's pick up this story. Now, Peter sat outside in the courtyard and a servant girl came to him saying, You also were with Jesus in Galilee. But, notice this, Peter denied it before them all saying, I do not know what you are saying. And when he had gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, This fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But again, Peter denied with an oath, I do not know the man. And a little later, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, Surely you are one of them, for your speech betrays you. You see, he had a little bit of a Galilean accent. Then he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. And immediately a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, who had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And it says, So he went out and wept bitterly. Peter was guilt-ridden. And Peter's guilt-ridden reaction to his denial of Jesus led him to repentance and to just not too much longer after that, a few weeks receiving God's Holy Spirit. A few weeks after these events, we find Peter standing in the temple fearlessly, not denying, but preaching Jesus as the prophesied Messiah. What a change in a man because he repented of his guilt and he asked for God's forgiveness. And just like David, he experienced that forgiveness from God. Our second example is found here in Matthew 27, right into the next chapter. And this actually is describing a time just a few hours after Peter's denial. Here's what it says in verse 1. When morning came, all the chief priests and elders of the people plotted against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. And then Judas. Now remember, Judas was one of the disciples, the one who had actually betrayed Jesus to these leaders. It says, then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. Obviously, Judas did not realize they would end up condemning him and putting him to death. And he's, he's horrified at what he's done. And he comes back and he tries to give them back the silver. He tries now to undo what he's done. And they said, what is that to us? You see to it. He then threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed. And it says in the Bible, and he went and hanged himself. Judas' guilt creating the emotions of feeling guilty, led to self-destruction. He did not repent before God. He destroyed himself. Now, is your response to being found guilty before God, which all of us do, and both of these men did, 
Is your response like Peter or like Judas? If we don't properly deal with the reality of our guilt, we will tailspin into self-destruction. And ultimately, we find ourselves spiritually cut off from God and facing His judgment. But through confession and repentance, we can receive forgiveness and you'll find hope for eternity. Now, I mentioned the judgment of God. It sounds harsh. It's not a popular message. Some theologians try to discount God's judgment with the teaching of irresistible grace. This is the belief that you know, once God forgives a person, no future actions matter. Did you know that that is not what the Bible teaches? Okay. The Bible actually teaches that it is possible for a Christian to remove himself or herself from God's grace. Let's look at what the New Testament book of Hebrews says about this. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and the raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Now, realize the writer of the book of Hebrews is not writing to pagans. He's writing to Christians. He goes on, he says, Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. In the Old Testament, if someone committed a sin, they were brought before the elders and the Levites in the land, and on the testimony of two or three witnesses, they could be stoned. Now, the writer of Hebrews goes on, How much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? You know, these verses should give all Christians a pause. They do to me from time to time. Now, now remember, if a Christian breaks one of God's instructions and finds himself guilty before the great judge, he can still receive forgiveness and a renewed relationship with God through repentance. This is the wonderful gift of grace. But to cheapen God's grace by willfully disobeying God's laws after He has shown you the light of His grace, it is to return to a state of guilt and condemnation. It is to insult the spirit of grace. How horrible is it to overtly trample underfoot the blood of Jesus Christ as our Savior? The opposite of this kind of shamelessness is to refuse God's forgiveness by being obsessed with guilty feelings over past mistakes. God is offering us, He's offering you, He's offering me forgiveness and love. When we overburden ourselves with feelings of guilt over the past, we deny, we even reject God's offer. If we allow guilt to eat at us, it can create a barrier between you and God. God, our Father, the Creator, the Supreme Being of the universe, is offering you forgiveness and freedom from guilt. Now think about this. Who are we to hold on to what God has let go? I mean, think about it. To hang on to our sins when God is offering forgiveness, you know, it's just the ultimate human arrogance. God wants to take you from guilt to glory. When we repent of our sins by accepting the death of Jesus Christ as the substitute penalty for our guilt, we are, in the mind of God, completely forgiven. The burden of guilt can then be lifted from our minds. And you know what? This is only the first step in what God wants to do in your life. He wants to renew your conscience. He, he wants to strip you of hurtful, wrong feelings of guilt and give you a conscience that's actually sensitive to His ways. A conscience that, yes, is going to suffer guilty feelings when you've gone against His ways. And these feelings then motivate you 
to return to your Father and repent. And the result is a restored relationship with God as your Father and Jesus Christ as your Lord and Master. I'd like to again remind you about today's free Bible study aid titled Tools for Spiritual Growth. Now when you order this study aid, you'll learn what the Holy Scriptures reveal about how you can grow in spiritual strength and build a personal relationship with God. Now, if you're not already a subscriber, then when you call, we'll also send you a free subscription to our magazine, The Good News. This 40-page bi-monthly publication will truly help energize your personal study of the Bible. Each issue of The Good News is packed full of articles that will not only help you live a more fulfilling life, but will help you understand your God-ordained purpose and what's really ahead for your future. You will find informative, encouraging, and practical articles on what the Bible teaches about prophecy, doctrine, faith, family, and how to develop a more meaningful relationship with your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So please, don't wait. Call right now, 1-888-886-8632. That's 1-888-886-8632. Or go online at beyondtoday.tv for the study aid, Tools for Spiritual Growth, the Good News Magazine. I, I really hope you take us up on this free offer. We've been discussing what it means to be declared guilty by God and how He offers us forgiveness. We've been joined by fellow Beyond Today host Darius McNeely and Steve Myers. You know, over the years, all three of us have counseled a lot of people who suffer with guilt. Now, as a pastor, how do you help somebody who comes with you and is just suffering with a burden of guilt? That, Gary, is one of the, the hardest things to work with, and it's most one of the most common. When it pulls us to God, it's good. That's good, but if, if we can't then jettison it from our life, it becomes baggage that really begins to weigh us down, and we've, guilt is not good. That is a, a mantra that one must understand ultimately in their life. Mm -hmm. One of the challenges, I think, is when uh, you do have guilt in your life and you're burdened down, what do you do with it? You know, it can take you down the wrong path and just tear you down. But 2 Corinthians 7 talks about the fact there's a, a good guilt or a godly sorrow is the way it puts it in 2 Corinthians 7 that can motivate us to have a zeal for God, that can help clear us, that can vindicate us if it moves us to repentance, to change the way we think, ask God for, give, for, for His forgiveness, and then reestablish a right relationship with Him. And so guilt can be good. So if we can help people to understand, I've got to change my thinking, I've got to change my way of life and go God's way, that guilt can be a good thing. I think when we realize that guilt is an actual state, there's actual laws, there's actual standards, Right. we can be forgiven of that and then restored and stop doing the behavior. And part of removing that guilt is coming to understand that there is a state of guilt, but that it is removed by Christ's sacrifice and we don't have to carry it around anymore. So what do we do when somebody comes, and, and we, we've all heard this too, I know God forgives me, but I just can't forgive myself. How do we deal with that? You know, forgiving ourselves uh, is an important part of the process. And if we can't, it's usually a sign that we are too much absorbed by our own self. It is not about us. Uh, it is only to the degree that we acknowledge our sin, our guilt. But then when we understand Christ's sacrifice and the grace through that relationship with Christ and the Father, then it transfers to them and becomes about God and His mercy and forgiveness, and then we get our mind off of ourself and onto God and a relationship with Him. Yeah, that relationship is such an important thing because of the fact that, that sometimes we think God is ready to get us, yeah. and we feel even more guilty with that type of a situation. And It reminded me of Psalm 86, 5, where it talks about the fact that God is good, but not only good, He's ready to forgive. And sometimes we're hesitant to really take that to heart, that God is ready to forgive us and, and able to forgive us. So that should help us to turn that much more quickly when we have those feelings of guilt to Him. Isn't it amazing that when you allow God to take the guilt off of you, you realize, I am guilty, now He erases the sin, I'm going to try to obey, you actually become free to love others. You become free to be outward instead of, like you said, Again, obsessed. Yeah, you, yeah. Get your mind, you begin to get your mind off of yourself onto God and onto other people um, in, in a right way that uh, helps us then to have a, a healthy, balanced approach to life. How can people, though, do the opposite? They take this grace of God and use it as a license to sin. 
you, you can't just use that as an excuse. Uh, sin is a transgression of God's law, and it does it's a disconnect with God in a relationship with Him. Uh, once we acknowledge and understand that there is a problem, we have to do our part to move away from that by a change in actual behavior. Mm -hmm. Romans 6.1, should we sin more because of grace? And the answer is absolutely not. We've got to change our behavior, repent and turn to God. Paul is emphatic on that point. Well, he was. I'd like to remind you about ordering your personal copy of Tools for Spiritual Growth and your free subscription to The Good News Magazine. Please call the toll-free number, one 886 8632 That's one 888 8632 Or you can read both online at beyondtoday.tv. Remember, all of our publications are absolutely free of charge and offered as an educational service. Please be assured your name and address will not be given to anyone. And I'd like to invite you to join us throughout the week on our website at beyondtoday.tv for BT Daily, where you can obtain further information about prophecy, God's great plan for your life, and much more. Beyond Today television programs and BT Dailies can also be viewed on demand anytime, day or night, on Roku, YouTube, and Vimeo. You can download your programs directly to your iPad, Kindle, and your Nook. Now, additionally, the United Church of God has hundreds of congregations across the United States and throughout the world with caring pastors available to help you on your spiritual journey as a disciple of Jesus Christ. You're welcome to visit beyondtoday.tv by clicking on the contact tab to find a congregation near you and call one of our pastors to share your story. And we invite you to join us every other Wednesday night for Beyond Today Bible studies on topics vital to your Christian growth. Simply click on the live Bible study link on our website at beyondtoday.tv and tune into the live webcast. You can also view archives of previous studies. All of us are guilty before the Almighty God. Will your response be like Peter or like Judas? God wants to take you from guilt to glory. He wants to erase your guilt this forgiveness came at a terrible price, the torture and death of the Son of God as your substitute and my substitute. The good news is that Jesus Christ has been resurrected and is actively seeking those who are fed up with meaningless existence and want to turn their lives over to God and enter His kingdom. Join us next week of Beyond Today as we continue to discover the gospel of the kingdom. We also invite you to join us in constantly praying, Thy kingdom come. From beyond today, I'm Gary Petty. Thanks for watching. For the free literature offered on today's program, go online to beyondtoday.tv. Please join us again next week on Beyond Today.